Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 65, Burn It to the Ground. Last week, a 16-year-old Nero ascended to the throne, and, after spending a brief period dominated by his mother and other influential advisors, emerged as his own man. Maybe that's too strong a reading, as it conjures up images of Augustus or Tiberius emerging as their own men, which implies a degree of independent competence that Nero never really attained, but he had definitely passed a point where it became dangerous to exert too much overt control over the emperor. If nothing else, Nero had to think he was the man in charge, even if his policies were usually influenced on the front end and executed on the back end by men with their own agendas. Not that these separate agendas were nefarious, mind you. A lot of that backroom influencing resulted in the reigning in of Nero's impulsiveness and making sure his grandiose declarations were always interpreted in as sound and practical a manner as possible. It would be a few years yet before the men who were a positive influence on the young emperor were replaced by men who encouraged Nero to embrace the darker side of his character for their own ends. This week, though, I want to move away from the cutthroat politics of the imperial court and focus instead on the foreign pressures the empire faced during the first half of Nero's reign. Because right off the bat, Rome's enemies took one look at the untested 16-year-old emperor and decided that now was the perfect time to push Rome around. In the east, the Parthians took advantage of the situation to strengthen their position in Armenia, a semi-independent buffer state that had been the source of so much conflict over the years. While the Romans dealt with rising tensions and then eventually all-out war with the Parthians, a revolt in the newly acquired province of Britannia would break out, led by the warrior Queen Boudicca, that would erupt with such ferocious energy that for a while Nero considered just abandoning the island altogether. Eventually, though, the uprising in Britannia would be put down and a settlement reached with the Parthians. Both conflicts left a lot of lingering resentment and unanswered questions about the future, but all in all, Nero's response to these threats earned him a solid C, maybe even a C plus, in foreign policy. He didn't gain any territory, but he didn't lose any territory either, though his critics did accuse him of essentially giving up Rome's hegemony over Armenia when the final deal with Parthia was signed. But I would argue that the agreement, which averted continuous war with Parthia, actually goes down on the credit rather than the debit side of Nero's ledger. Trouble in the east began to bubble to the surface at the end of Claudius's reign. Since the time of Augustus, a deal had been worked out between Rome and Parthia, whereby Rome retained the right to appoint the monarch of Armenia, this nominally independent buffer state. The arrangement worked out fine until the early 50s AD, when the Roman-nominated king was overthrown by his own nephew. The nephew turned out to be a terrible ruler, and the people of Armenia soon grew to despise him. The new king of Parthia, Volagasis I, saw what was going on in Armenia and decided that he could make his mark on history by prying the country away from the Romans. So, skillfully parlaying disgust with the sitting king into support for a Parthian alternative, Vologases invaded Armenia and installed his own brother Tiridates on the throne. After a few years of back and forth between the rival claimants, the people of Armenia backed Tiridates, and in 54 AD the Parthians found themselves effectively ruling Armenia. 54 AD is also, of course, the year that Claudius died and Nero became emperor, making the eastern encroachment of the Parthians one of the first major tests of the new emperor's mettle. Being young and wanting to make a mark himself, Nero was convinced to push back hard against the Parthians. To spearhead this pushback, Nero appointed a man named Nius Domitius Corbulo, a general who had made a name for himself battling the always active Germanic tribes during the reigns of Caligula and Claudius. Corbulo was made propraetor, and later proconsul, of the provinces of Cappadocia and Galatia, and instructed to gather and train an army that could be put in the field against the Parthians should diplomatic overtures fail. As he gathered his forces, though, it became apparent that the bulk of whatever force he led would be drawn from the legions stationed in Syria. So for the next few years, while Rome waited for Parthia to back down and Parthia waited for Rome to give up, Corbulo trained his men going so far as to keep them encamped throughout the winter to get them ready for the harsh conditions they would find in mountainous Armenia. The basic demand of the Romans was simple. Uh, Tiridates had to travel to Rome and receive an official endorsement from the emperor. Otherwise, his presence on the Armenian throne would be considered illegitimate and an act of war, 
the Parthians hemmed and hawed, and so finally, in 58 AD, Corbulo was given the green light to begin pressing the Roman case by other means. Tiridates had scattered his defense forces across Armenia to avoid the decisiveness that comes with a single large battle. So rather than invading the country with a single column, Corbulo sent in dozens of small detachments and simultaneously ordered the Roman allied kings along the Armenian border to begin stirring up trouble. If he couldn't knock Tiridates out with a single punch, Corbulo was content to do it with a thousand cuts. At first, things went well for Rome, and in short order, the swarming legions caused Tiridates to demand a meeting. The two sides agreed to come together, but when the Armenians showed up with a thousand men and the Romans showed up with three thousand men, Tiridates got spooked and took off in the middle of the night, convinced that he was about to be ambushed. The Armenians then tried to cut off the supply line of the legions, the tactic that had brought Mark Antony to his knees, but Corbulo had studied his military history and made sure that his supply chain, though long, was well defended. Unable to make a dent against the Roman invasion, Tiridates fell back into a defensive posture, leading Corbulo to recall his own scattered forces and prepare them for a series of traditional assaults on the main Armenian strongholds. Encountering little real resistance, the Romans captured city after city on their way to the northern capital of Artashata, where Tiridates had holed up. The Armenian king dispatched everything he had against the besieging Roman forces, but he was unable to break their line. Tiridates was forced to flee and abandon his capital. Unable to garrison the city properly, Corbulo burned it to the ground. The next year, the legions headed towards Tigranocerta, the capital of southern Armenia. It was a difficult road, and along the way at least one plot to assassinate the hard-driving Corbulo was exposed. The conspirators, mostly allied Armenians who had grown tired of following the Romans, were all executed. The affair actually turned out pretty well for the targeted Roman general, not only because he survived, but also because, when he arrived outside of Tigranocerta, it is reported that he launched one of the conspirators' heads into the city, reminding the leaders of the capital what happened to those who defied Rome. The ruling council voted to surrender without a fight. By the end of 59 AD, Tiridates was on the run and Corbulo crowned Tigranes VI as the new king of Armenia. Having successfully ejected the Parthians from this key territory with only minimal losses, Corbulo was hailed as a hero back in Rome and became the most celebrated general of his generation. As a reward for his achievement, the victorious Corbulo was given the governorship of Syria, the most important province in the Eastern Empire, aside from Egypt, of course. He left a legion garrisoned in Armenia to support the new king and headed south to his new assignment, believing the Armenian question had now been answered. But it was not to be so. As it would turn out, Corbulo's victories came so easily because, while the Romans were intensely focused on the conflict in Armenia, Volagases and the Parthians were being pulled in a dozen different directions, dealing with nasty revolts both out on their frontiers and within their royal family itself. Stretched so thin, Parthia was unable to supply Tiridates with the resources he needed to successfully ward off the Roman assault. But in 61 AD, following probably ill-advised raids into Parthia by Tigranes VI, things changed. There was no way Volgasis could ignore such an insult. Settling his other internal problems so as not to be distracted, the Romans soon discovered that they had earned Parthia's full attention. From here on out, things would not be so easy. Just as things were about to get dicey in the east, a revolt in Britannia exploded with such force that Nero and his advisors seriously considered just giving up the island completely. At what point, they wondered, will it simply no longer be worth it to hold this cold and foggy island on the edge of the world? But as quickly as it started, the revolt flamed out. However, had Gaius Suetonius Paulinus lost the Battle of Watling Street, which, given how outnumbered he was, was not entirely out of the question, there is a very real possibility that the Romans would have withdrawn from Britain completely, altering the course of Western European history in the process. The trouble began in either 60 or 61 AD, no one seems sure of the actual date, when Prasutagus, the king of the Iceni, died. During the initial Roman invasion of Britain in 43, the Iceni, who hailed from modern-day Norfolk on the east coast of Britain, had either been one of the eleven tribes who surrendered to Claudius, or they had worked out an independent peace with the Romans not long after. 
However it happened, the Iceni had been able to maintain their independence, and Prasutagus was set up as an official client king of the Roman Empire. In an attempt to keep control of his tribe within the family, Prasutagus filled out a will that left Iceni territory jointly to the Romans on the one hand and his wife and daughters on the other. But when the king died, the Roman procurator of the province, a particularly rapacious character named Cadus Decianus, announced that patriarchal Rome did not recognize the rights of women when it came to inheritance. The claims of the Iceni were denied, and their territory was annexed by Rome. To the Britons, who had no problem with women inheriting property or holding positions of authority, this was incomprehensible. It was right and good that the king's wife should rule upon his death and his daughters grow up to be queens. So when Boudicca, the widow of the dead king, went about her business as usual and paid no more or less tribute to the Romans than before, she was shocked at the Roman reaction. Soldiers were sent to her village. Boudicca was tied up and flogged while her daughters were carted off and raped. These ghastly acts committed, the Romans believed that they had put the upstart women in their place and thought no more of it little realizing that they had just lit a fuse that was burning quickly down towards the powder keg that was Queen Boudicca. With the Roman governor of Britain, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, leading the majority of the British legions on a campaign on the Isle of Anglesey in Wales, Boudicca took the opportunity to translate her fury into action. After convincing a neighboring tribe to join in the fun, Boudicca gathered everyone up and declared war on Rome. The first stop was Camelodunum, the original headquarters of the Roman occupying force and site of a great temple built to the now divine Claudius. When Roman scouts brought back word that a huge force of Britons was headed straight for the city, the call for reinforcements went out. But with the bulk of the British legions occupied in Wales, the procurator Decianus decided that Boudicca's revolt wasn't worth rearranging the remaining garrisons for and only sent an additional 200 troops to Camelodunum. Not surprisingly, 200 more troops didn't do the Romans in the city much good, as Boudicca's force had to be in the tens of thousands. I'm having trouble tracking down an accurate headcount for them. The Britain rebels easily crashed the gates, forcing the surviving Romans to make a last stand in the barricaded temple of Claudius, where, after two days of fighting, they were annihilated. Camel and Dunham was then burned to the ground. After the scale of the danger posed to the residents of Camel and Dunham became apparent, a detachment of 2,500 men from a nearby legion were sent to reinforce the city, but by the time they arrived, it was too late. They showed up just in time to find the smoldering remains of Camel and Dunham and a horde of British warriors with their hackles raised and nothing else to do. The subsequent encounter, known as the Massacre of the Ninth Legion, did not, as you can imagine, end well for the Romans. When news of the destruction of Camel and Dunham reached Suetonius in Wales, he immediately abandoned his campaign and marched straight for the new commercial center of Londinium, founded 20 years before and thriving nicely. But upon arrival, he assessed the situation and decided the new city was indefensible. With Boudicca marching straight for them, he abandoned the town and looked for a better position from which to direct his counterattack. Boudicca had no trouble overrunning undefended Londinium, she burned it to the ground and slaughtered anyone crazy enough to stay in the city after Suetonius left with his legions. Boudicca then marched on Verulamium, the site of modern St. Albans, and put it too to the torch. This string of victories was gaining Boudicca quite a reputation, and disaffected Britons from across the country flocked to her banner. The Romans were on the run, and with a little luck, they might just be run off the island altogether. But Suetonius was not ready to give up just yet. He managed to gather about 10,000 troops, composed of portions of a few legions and irregular auxiliary forces, and stationed them at a defensible position in the West Midlands, along a trade road known later as Watling Street. Though reports that Boudicca led 230,000 warriors is certainly an exaggeration, there is no doubt that the Romans were massively outnumbered. Tacitus reports that though Suetonius arrayed his men in a single line, it was not enough to match the length of the far deeper British army. But Suetonius knew what he was doing and had placed himself at a spot where only so many Britons could attack at any one time, partially negating the huge numerical disadvantage he faced. Boudicca roused her army with a speech imploring them to make this moment the last moment for the Romans in Britain and reminding them that she stood before them not as an aristocrat whose power had been usurped but as a free woman whose liberty had been denied. 
Victory would mean freedom. Defeat would mean slavery. Unfortunately for the British, as we have seen so many times before, when it came to set peace battles out in the open, the Romans were second to none, even when they were outnumbered ten to one. When the British charged, the Roman line formed into a wedge and drove into the oncoming mass of warriors. Before too long, the British discovered the difficulty of breaking a disciplined Roman line and began to retreat. But Boudicca's army was not just an army. It was also a rolling caravan of her entire tribe, and before the battle, she had stationed the wagons and dependents who made up the rest of the troop behind the actual warriors. Now that the army was in full retreat, they ran headlong into the stationary wagons, and chaos ensued. Utterly snarled, the Romans were able to descend and go into slaughter mode. Of the 230,000 Boudicca led into the Battle of Watling Street, 80,000 now lay dead on the plain. Roman losses were put at 400. Her revolt shattered, Boudicca drank poison to avoid capture. Boudicca's rebellion very nearly caused Nero to abandon Britain altogether. Had she been able to lure Suetonius onto less favorable ground, it is likely that her far superior numbers would have been able to overwhelm him. But in the end, if there was one thing the Romans did really well, it was running a savvy military operation, so the counterfactual just doesn't hold up. Having abandoned Londinium, it was clear that the one thing Suetonius was not going to do was be lured onto unfavorable ground. Inevitably, Boudicca's furious revolt was going to run into the cold, careful planning of the Roman legions, and, like so many before her, she would be destroyed by it. Rome was pleased to hear the good news arriving from Britain that the uprising had been quelled, but they were simultaneously nonplussed by the news coming in from the east. Having set a Roman client back on the throne of Armenia, Corbulo had settled conditions in the east back into their natural state. But Tigranes VI, the new king of Armenia, immediately tried to upend the apple cart by raiding into Parthian territory. Where before the Parthian king Volgases had regretfully deemed the Armenian situation a low priority, invasions into Parthia itself were another matter. Reacting to the enraged pleas from his loyal subjects, the Parthian king settled his other business and turned back to the Mediterranean. He formally announced that his brother Tiridates was still the rightful king of Armenia and recrowned him as such. A Parthian force then invaded Armenia and attempted to dislodge the Roman garrisons, but they were unsuccessful. Hoping to keep things civil, Corbulo met with Vologases, and it was agreed that both empires would leave the disputed country while envoys from Parthia traveled to Rome and attempted to work out a deal. But by the spring of 62, no deal had been struck, and hostilities were renewed. This time, with Corbulo focused on protecting the key province of Syria from possible attack, Nero appointed a legate named Lucius Sassanius Paetus to spearhead operations in Armenia. The new commander took two legions and marched them straight toward Tigranocerta, which had been seized by the Parthians. But after a few easy but minor victories, he was forced to withdraw when winter came due to an unsteady supply line before reaching the southern capital. The ease of the first year's campaign had lulled Paetus into a false sense of security. When, in early 63, this false sense of security was shattered, he quickly showed himself to be a pretty awful commander. Unable to make any headway against Corbulo's fortifications in Syria, which Vologases had been planning to invade, the Parthian king decided to abandon the attempt and just go for broke in Armenia. So when this second Parthian army, which Paetus had not accounted for, suddenly appeared along the Roman-Armenian border where he was camped for the winter, Paetus panicked. Having sent his officers away on leave and having dispersed the rest of his troops across the countryside, Paetus was in no position to fight the Parthians. He hastily ordered the troops he had on hand to blockade the various passes in the mountains to prevent the Parthians from entering Roman territory, but this had the effect of only dispersing his already dispersed troops even more. The Parthians were able to easily overrun these small detachments, forcing Paetus to fall back into his fortified camps outside of Randia. Facing imminent doom, Paetus was paralyzed. The most proactive thing he could think of to do was to call Corbulo for help. Having never liked Paetus to begin with, Corbulo took his sweet time gathering a relief force, but when the reports became sufficiently dire, he marched out half the men at his disposal and attempted to reach the besieged legions in time. 
but he would arrive too late. While en route, Pietus had given up and surrendered to Volagases. The terms of the surrender were humiliating for Rome. The Parthian king demanded that the defeated army build him a bridge across a nearby river so his entourage could march over it victoriously. Then, according to some sources, he allowed the Romans to leave only after marching them under the yoke, which, as you recall from the Battle of the Coline Gate during the Samnite Wars, was about as humiliating as it gets. The remnants of Pietus' army met up with the approaching legions led by Corbulo, and despite Pietus' pleas to keep fighting, Corbulo refused and led the whole force back to Syria, unwilling to risk getting entangled with the Parthians at a time and place of their choosing. Having driven the Romans out of Armenia, Volagasi sent envoys to Rome to work out a new peace accord. When the envoys arrived, though, Nero and the Senate were shocked to discover the magnitude of Pietus' defeat. Though he had been communicating his ever-worsening position at Corbulo, Pietus had continued to send cheerful letters back to Rome, acting as if nothing was amiss. So when Parthian envoys showed up with news of Roman legions marching out under the yoke, the leaders of Rome had trouble fitting this revelation into their heads. For God's sake, the triumphal arch, marking the defeat of the Parthians in Armenia, was already halfway constructed. What are we supposed to do with a halfway built triumphal arch? Turn it into a giant swing set? Pietus was immediately recalled to Rome, and Corbulo was given emergency imperium over the entire Eastern Empire. His job was to whip the Parthians and make sure that it stuck this time. Corbulo led a large force out of Syria and into Armenia to do just that, but before a battle could be fought, Volagasi sent word that he wanted to deal. He knew full well that Corbulo was not Pietus and that the Romans would not be taken so easily again. So the two sides met and struck a deal. Henceforth, Parthia would be able to appoint the monarch of Armenia, but their choice had to be ratified by the Roman emperor. Tiridates then laid his diadem down in front of a statue of Nero the Romans had brought, and swore not to put it back upon his head until Nero had placed it there. In 66 AD, Tiridates then did travel to Rome to meet with the emperor and accept his crown. Nero threw a huge party and made a big to-do about his right to crown the king of Armenia, but critics within the Senate and beyond believe the emperor had done nothing less than hand Armenia over to the Parthians. Ratify the candidate that they nominate? What great power is that? But defenders of Nero saw it as a practical move that averted all-out war with the one power big enough to really challenge Rome. In closing out the ceremony, Nero even went so far as to close the rarely closed gates of the Temple of Janus, which signaled the arrival of universal peace. Universal peace, though, never lasts long. Next week, just months after the gate swings shut, they will be opened again. The always simmering province of Judea will finally boil over, leading to what is now known as the Great Jewish Revolt. The historical implications of this brief conflict were vast, as the Romans both destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem and triggered a diaspora of Jews out of the east, with the survivors of the revolt fleeing to communities across the empire, which sowed the seeds for so much medieval and modern tension between Jew and Gentile. Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 66, 666. At the end of last week's episode, I hinted that today we would be getting into the Great Jewish Revolt, which erupted in Judea in 66 AD and led to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. However, as I began to unpack my outline for this week, I quickly realized that this hinting was premature. So, to those of you out there who got really psyched for that story, sorry, you're going to have to wait until next week. There is too much I want to get into about Nero, the great fire of Rome, the emperor's relationship with the early Christians, and his relationship with the Senate to cram the Great Revolt in there too. So, the Great Revolt will be next week. This week, was Nero actually the Antichrist? You'll remember from two weeks ago that in 59 AD, Nero had grown so tired of his mother Agrippina that he conspired to have her killed. Though this act of matricide could not be said to mark a clear line between Nero the self-indulgent and Nero the sadist, 
since on the one hand, killing your own mother goes way beyond self-indulgent, and on the other, Nero the Sadist didn't really get going until after the death of the Praetorian prefect Burrus in 62 AD, the death of Agrippina pretty clearly foreshadowed what Nero was capable of and what he was becoming. But like I say, it wasn't a clear breaking point. For a few years, Nero continued on as he always had, moderately interested in the affairs of state and excessively interested in affairs of, well, excess. He served as consul four times from 55 to 60 AD, an office which, while not as important as it had once been, was still a key administrative cog in the empire, signaling that Nero enjoyed at least some aspects of practical governance, but at the same time, he began to take his leisure pursuits even more seriously than he had in the past. Nero was essentially a bohemian emperor. He liked drinking, poetry, and music. He liked lazing around during the day and partying his way through the night. He and his friends would go on drunken romps through the city, stirring up trouble at brothels and bathhouses, and generally making the L.A. nightclub scene look like a meeting of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But even with the emperor whirling around Rome in a debauched frenzy every night, the day-to-day -day operations of empire were still in relatively good hands. The prefect Burrus and Seneca the Younger continued to act as moderating hands, steering the no doubt perpetually hung over Nero away from this terrible idea and toward that sound policy. But in the early 60s AD, things began to change, and the sort of embarrassing but harmless Bohemian Emperor began to turn into something much darker, and in response, the people of Rome began to turn on him. In 58 AD, Nero met the wife of his friend Otho, who was a stunning and ambitious woman named Papia Sabina, and was immediately smitten with her. Papia was more than happy to return the emperor's affections, as it was widely rumored that she had initially targeted Otho for marriage specifically to get closer to Nero. The two began to have an affair shortly thereafter that some pointed to as the key factor in Nero's decision to off his disapproving mother, and though that explanation has been pretty well debunked, it is worth noting again that the accusation was thrown around at the time. The reason Agrippina disapproved is that Nero was still married to Claudia Octavia, the daughter of Claudius. The union between Nero and Claudia kept the two wings of the Julio-Claudian dynasty tied together, and Agrippina didn't want Nero to throw that away in a fit of young lust. Mistresses were fine, as long as they remained mistresses. But Nero was never happy in his arranged marriage and was always looking to turn his mistresses into wives something that would shatter the only recently reunited bonds of the Julians and the Claudians. Papia, for her part, had no interest in remaining Nero's mistress, and was forever whispering in the emperor's ear that he ought to ditch his prudish wife and marry her instead. In 62 AD, things came to a head when Papia announced that she was pregnant with Nero's child. The emperor finally decided that it was time to give up all the pretenses, and announced to the people that on grounds of infertility, he was divorcing Octavia and marrying Papia instead. He then banished Octavia to the same small island that had previously been the de facto prison of her aunt, Agrippina the Elder. Eighteen days later, Nero married Papia in a lavish ceremony. The divorce and remarriage of Nero marks the first time the public really turned on the young emperor. Up until now, he had been riding his Julian blood and generous social programs right into the hearts of the masses. But the people seemed to take the betrayal of Octavia personally. Well liked for her noble demeanor, they couldn't understand why Nero was suddenly dumping this fine Roman woman who they were all proud to call their empress. And who was taking her place? Some harlot adulterer? No, they weren't happy about this at all. It got so bad that people began carrying statues of Octavia through the streets, demanding that she be recalled from exile. Nero, spooked by the sudden demonstrations, nearly caved in, but Papia convinced him to do the other thing, the thing where, sorry, Octavia is dead, so as much as I'd like to, there's no one really left to recall. Imperial agents staged the murder of Octavia to make it look like a suicide, but no one was buying it. Whatever benefit of the doubt Nero had been receiving was now gone, and two years later, when Rome went up in flames, no one hesitated to accuse the emperor of setting the blaze himself for his own insane purposes. But it wasn't just the incident with Octavia that turned the people against Nero. In general, his policies were trending towards unsustainable extravagance. Not typical rich boy extravagance, mind you, 
but a budget-busting, megalomaniacal extravagance that was beginning to weigh the whole empire down. The key shift in his attitude came later in 62 AD, when the Praetorian prefect Burrus died of an illness. Though he had been gradually losing favor with the emperor, especially since the arrival of Papia, Burrus was still a positive influence on Nero, and his death left a giant hole where moderation used to be. His death also left the key office of Praetorian prefect open, and Nero filled the vacancy, not with a man who would moderate his vices, but who would openly encourage them. Further, with Burrus dead, Seneca the Younger found himself isolated in an imperial court that was now dominated by Papia and her friends. After they began passing around rumors that the old man was embezzling from the state treasury, Seneca knew that he was a marked man. Rather than run the risk of winding up in front of some treason trial on trumped-up charges, Seneca resigned from his post and retired to a quiet life of philosophical contemplation. Not that it would all do him much good. Recognizing that his young charge was becoming a massive liability for the empire, Seneca would get caught up in the Pisonian conspiracy and then be exposed along with everyone else when the plot was betrayed in 65 AD, all of which I'll get to in a moment. The man who replaced Burrus as prefect was Gaius Ophonius Tigellinus, and it can be justifiably said that the downfall of Nero coincides neatly with the rise of Tigellinus. The new prefect quickly gained a reputation for cruelty, and spent the majority of his seven odd years in office either persecuting the enemies of Nero or orchestrating his mass orgies. As I just said, where Burrus had acted to keep Nero in check, Tigellinus actively encouraged the emperor to indulge himself without reservation or hesitation. The combined influence of Papia and the new Praetorian prefect unhinged Nero completely from his superego, and sent him down a path that eventually led to him committing suicide after being declared an enemy of the state in 68 AD. So remember kids, the superego may be a joyless old stick in the mud, but it's there for a reason. In 64 AD, the negative consequences of the emperor's excesses were finally put on full display following one of the seminal events of Nero's reign, the Great Fire of Rome. The accusations and counter-accusations about who was behind the disaster paint a picture of an emperor who had not only lost the faith of the aristocratic classes, but of the general public as well, because the widely spread and widely believed rumor was that Nero had himself started the blaze. A popular and well-regarded ruler does not usually have to answer questions about whether or not he has burned his own capital down, but an increasingly disliked and despotic ruler? Well, those are exactly the sorts of questions that everyone starts asking. As disconnected as he was becoming from reality, though, Nero wasn't oblivious to this evidence of his sinking popularity or the threat that that posed to his regime. His decision to scapegoat the early Christians and blame them for starting the fire is clear evidence that Nero decided he needed some kind of evil foil to point to, to keep the public's attention off of his own failings. With the Romans already suspicious of those weirdo Christian cultists, Nero guessed that it would be easy to fan the flames of bigotry, and in the process, maybe regain some of his lost popularity. Accounts of the breadth and depth of the Great Fire differ, but the classic accounting is that three of the fourteen districts of Rome wound up utterly destroyed, and another seven were badly damaged. The fire broke out near the Circus Maximus and quickly raged out of control, ultimately burning for somewhere between five and seven days before running out of fuel. In addition to the countless homes and businesses that were destroyed in the blaze, portions of the Imperial Palace were consumed, along with the hearth of the Vestal Virgins and the Temple of the Jupiter Stator, which legend had it had been founded by Romulus himself after the Romans' first successful battle with the Sabines. The fire was devastating, and in its aftermath, the displaced victims, families who had lost everything, naturally wanted to know what had happened, why it had happened, and how it had happened. But there was no clear cause, and in the absence of a plausible explanation, rumors began to fly that perhaps Nero was behind the whole thing. It had long been known that the emperor dreamed of building a massive palace complex in the heart of the city, so wasn't it obvious that Nero had sent his agents, led by that damned Tigellinus, to start the fire in order to clear out the existing buildings that were in the way of his opulent vision. Reports began to crop up that while the fire raged, a joyful Nero had plucked at his prized lyre while watching the city go down in flames. In fact, 
Wasn't it true that setting the fire hadn't even been about building his golden palace? Wasn't it just that Nero desired a magnificent backdrop for some new performance, and that in the midst of the blaze he had dressed in a costume and sung the sack of Ilium for him and his monstrous friends? Wasn't it true that Nero had fiddled while Rome burned? So turned the rumor mill. But were any of these rumors actually true? I tend to follow Tacitus on this because, as biased as he is against Nero, he's usually reliable with his facts, and he reports that Nero wasn't even in Rome at the time, and when news that the city was on fire reached him, that he rushed back and immediately spearheaded a relief effort, housing refugees in the standing portion of the palace and arranging for food and water to be dispersed to victims throughout the city. Once the immediate emergency had passed, Nero then began a reconstruction effort that led to some pretty major revisions to the fire code and a rationalization of the organic mess that had been the urban plan of Rome. But for all these good works, Nero still managed to come off as the leading candidate for having set the fire, because in the aftermath, he did indeed set to work on building his golden palace, a complex of opulent buildings that eventually covered somewhere between 100 and 300 acres of prime downtown real estate. It was this blatant land grab as much as anything else that led many to believe that Nero had indeed set the fire. Conscious that his standing with the people was taking a hit, Nero decided he needed to find someone to take the fall for the fire. Someone he could point to and say, it was them, not me, I didn't have anything to do with it. But he couldn't just grab someone off the street, because with his popularity sinking like a stone, that would just engender the further charge that he was setting up some innocent to take all the blame. What Nero needed was someone, some group, that the people disliked even more than him someone that the people were ready, willing, and able to believe had done this horrible thing, if for no other reason than that the people were looking for an excuse to round up and punish them. Enter the Christians. In the thirty-odd years since the death of Christ, nascent Christian communities had begun cropping up throughout the empire. At first, they were primarily Jewish in character, but through the missionary work of St. Paul, known later as the Apostle to the Gentiles, this new religion began to spread into the Greco-Roman world. By the reign of Nero, a tiny community of believers, led, according to tradition by St. Peter, had established a religious beachhead in Rome itself. The problem the early Christians faced in Rome, though, was not just that their religion, in comparison to the wider pagan world, struck the average Roman as downright weird, but also that at this point, most Christian adherents were non-citizen resident aliens of the city, who spoke primarily Greek or Hebrew. So the Christians in Rome looked different, spoke a different language, usually came from the lower rungs of the social ladder, and belonged to a strange monotheistic cult that seemed to have cannibalistic overtones. All in all, they were capital O other in every sense of the word, and as has been proven over and over again by history, whenever terrible things happen to a community, economic problems, floods, plagues, fires, it is the capital O others who usually get blamed. So, desperate to shift responsibility for the great fire away from himself, Nero looked at these others and decided to lay it all on them. He sent out his agents into the city and had them round up as many identified Christians as they could find, drag them into dark rooms, and torture them until they admitted to starting the fire. These confessions in hand, Nero then decided to expand his persecution beyond some limited group of conspirators and target the Christian community as a whole. According to Tacitus, Nero embarked on his persecution with a cruel zeal. Christians were thrown to the dogs for public amusement, crucified and left to die, or, perhaps most gruesomely, crucified and then burnt alive to serve as torches for Nero's nightly parties. But if Nero was hoping that he could regain the public's favor by torturing Christians, he underestimated the humanity of the masses. Sure, the Christians are weird, and nobody really wants them around, but at a certain point, burning them alive for sport, while you and your friends watch and drink yourselves stupid? Really? That seems a bit excessive, you know? Sympathy for the Christians grew, while Nero wound up even more unpopular than he had been when he started. So you could say that the plan backfired. 
I should also note that while it is not confirmed that St. Peter himself was caught up specifically in the Great Fire persecutions, tradition does have him being crucified by the Romans at some point in the mid-60s AD. St. Peter's Basilica, the beating heart of the Catholic Church, is allegedly built upon the spot where he was buried. As unpopular as Nero was becoming with the people of Rome, their dissatisfaction paled in comparison to the feelings of the Christians themselves who now came to revile Nero with an understandable fury. It has been suggested, I think plausibly, that the reference in the book of Revelations to 666 being the number of the beast is a coded reference to Nero. I'm not going to get into the specifics of Jewish numerology, but basically, if you take the Greek spelling of Nero's name and translate it into Hebrew, you are left with a name that has the numerological value of 666. After Nero's suicide, there was a great deal of speculation, especially in the East, that Nero had not really died and was poised to make a dramatic comeback at any time. Fearful of Roman reprisals for speaking against the Caesars, but still wishing to warn their brethren about the threat that Nero posed, the early Christians used numerology to code in a reference for those with the wisdom to see. I think it's fair to say, too, that one of the primary reasons Nero has such a terrible historical reputation is that around about the 4th century, the church fathers got a hold of the history books and saw no reason to paint Nero as anything more than a demonic monster. While that perhaps went too far, even in his own time, Nero was fast running out of defenders. The people no longer trusted him, and the aristocracy, well, they hadn't liked him from the beginning. Like most autocrats, Nero had come to the throne promising greater power for the Senate and a lighter imperial hand, but before long, as usual, those promises were forgotten and the Senate returned to its natural state of irrelevancy. While this irrelevancy suited many men who were members primarily for the social status it conferred upon them, there was still a core group of senators who either had an interest in good governance for its own sake or had personal political ambitions that they thought membership in the Senate could advance. In either case, Nero's actions in the early to mid-60s AD inflamed both. The emperor was slashing taxes while increasing public works projects and diverting funds into the construction of his palace, which now featured a 120-foot statue of himself looking down upon the city, all of which left the state teetering on the brink of insolvency. This, of course, offended the good government types. At the same time, if you weren't a part of Nero's inner circle of friends, good luck advancing your career. Nero played favorites early and often, and there were dozens of powerful men who didn't get on with the emperor personally, which left them out in the cold politically. This, of course, offended the ambitious types. These various offenses bubbled under the surface until a formal conspiracy to assassinate Nero coalesced around Gaius Calpurnius Piso. Piso was a distinguished statesman and orator who enjoyed a fine reputation at all levels of Roman society and who had been watching the devolution of Nero's reign with disgust. If Rome could be ruled again by a man of talent like Augustus, rather than men like his incompetent and insane descendants, the empire might thrive again rather than simply stagnate as it seemed to be doing. Piso, a man of modest ego, decided that the very best candidate to rule Rome if the criteria was basic merit, was himself. Details of the plot remain sketchy, but it seems as though Piso had secured the support of Tigellinus's Praetorian prefect colleague, Phineas Rufus, and the two men had agreed that upon the assassination of Nero, however that went down, Rufus would lead Piso to the Praetorian camp, where Piso would be declared the new emperor. Dozens of men in the Senate, in the imperial bureaucracy, and in the army, eventually joined in the word-of-mouth conspiracy, including Seneca the Younger. But before the plan could be initiated, it was betrayed. When a young officer was heard complaining that his career had stalled because Nero didn't like him, he was approached about joining the growing plot. But rather than join, he decided to use the information he obtained to betray the plot as a means of currying favor with the emperor. Though the young officer lacked details, he put the imperial court on notice that a sizable chunk of the aristocracy was actively plotting the regime's downfall. In April of 65 AD, a freedman secretary confirmed the existence of the plot and provided the details that Nero's agents were looking for. Piso and everyone else 
were either ordered to commit suicide or were exiled to the provinces. Seneca committed suicide. The Pisonian conspiracy represented a very real threat to Nero. It was not some ham-fisted caper. It was a well-orchestrated plot that involved some of the most prominent men in Rome. Scared out of his wits that now everyone was out to get him, an increasingly paranoid Nero reinitiated indiscriminate treason trials, the bloody calling card of imperial insecurity. The trials, of course, only entrenched the aristocratic hatred of Nero, and in a few short years he would find himself fleeing his golden palace, friendless and officially an enemy of the state. I'm going to leave it there for this week. Next time, we'll hop back and forth between the final stages of Nero's reign and the Great Revolt that erupts in Judea in 66 AD. And after that, I'll lay the groundwork for the year of the four emperors, the death of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, and the rise of the new Flavian dynasty that took its place once all the dust had settled. But before we take off into that next phase of Roman history, as some of you have already noticed, the history of Rome will be going off the air for about four weeks, following the September 13th episode. I am getting married on September the 23rd, and then immediately moving from Portland, Oregon to Austin, Texas. So, long story short, I am going to be a very busy man and will not be able to pay my little podcast the attention it deserves. I want to direct all of you back to thehistoryofrome.typepad.com, where I have posted a brief message on all of this, and also address the growing movement to have me keep going with this thing until the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which, as I explained, is most likely not going to happen. So, after this, we'll have three more episodes, the last of which will probably be a fun episode dedicated to Roman wedding customs, because, hey, right now it's basically wedding stuff all the time for me, so why should the history of Rome be any different? Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 67, What an Artist the World is Losing. Nero had dodged a bullet in 65 AD when the far-reaching Pisonian conspiracy was exposed before it had a chance to act. Thus far, Nero had been living his life with a sort of flippant disregard for the aristocracy, obsessed about his standing with the masses, sure, but not really giving a hoot what a bunch of crusty old senators thought about him. But after the plot was discovered, Nero was exposed to a reality that he had never really considered before. Not only were powerful men unhappy with him, but they were willing to go to extreme lengths to express their unhappiness. And not only were they willing to go to extreme lengths to express their unhappiness, but, except for one lucky break, they had almost gone to them. Nero suddenly realized that his reign and his life existed in a far more precarious place than he had previously thought. Now this is the point where a more introspective man, aided by wise counsel, might examine the roots of the aristocracy's displeasure and wonder what he, Nero, might be able to do to mute their anger. Were there things he did that were unnecessarily inflammatory? And that, if he knocked off the more extreme stuff, maybe he could avoid perpetually dealing with plots against his life? But Nero was not an introspective man, and his counsel was not wise. So, rather than repent his extravagances and grow up a little, he decided to dig in his heels. And if anyone didn't like it, well, there were always treason trials for the incorrigible. But as is so often the case, show trials and indiscriminate persecutions create far more enemies than they destroy, and in a few short years, Nero will reap the full blowback for his actions. 65 was not just a bad year for Nero because it was very nearly his last, but also because his wife Papia, mother of his daughter and pregnant with his second, died during the summer. There are conflicting reports about her death, with some surmising that Papia died naturally during childbirth, as often occurred in the ancient world. But of course, the more famous and salacious version offered by Suetonius and Tacitus is that, over the course of an argument, Nero became enraged and repeatedly kicked her in the stomach until she and the unborn child were dead. Whichever way it occurred, Nero became almost insane with grief, or remorse, depending on the version of the story you believe. And rather than cremating Papia, he had her stuffed and embalmed so that he could visit her in the imperial mausoleum. 
In the years after her death, Nero would delve even deeper into his singing, acting, and chariot racing um, career, culminating in 67 with his participation in the Olympic Games. Despite being thrown and nearly dying from a 10-horse chariot and delivering amateurish singing and acting performances, Nero won the victory crowns for every competition he entered. It was still good to be the king. While Nero was off pretending to be some great entertainer, in the Far East, the Romans became embroiled in what would prove to be the first of several major revolts in the combustible province of Judea. That the first of these is known simply as the Great Revolt is all you need to know about the impact the conflict will have on the history of the world. We won't be able to finish the whole thing today as in between the beginning and the end of it the whole year of the four emperors things happen, but we can at least get it started along its way. Trouble had been brewing in Judea from the moment the Romans first showed up in the region. Pompey the Great had famously entered the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem over the vehement protests of the high priest, which pretty much got the Romans and Jews off on the wrong foot. A short-lived revolt had broken out in the middle of Augustus's reign, and of course Caligula had nearly sparked a revolution when he insisted on having a statue of himself placed in the temple. But Judea remained relatively calm following the death of Caligula, as Claudius had done his best to walk the fine line between Roman administration and Jewish autonomy. But when Nero arrived on the scene, he was far less attentive to that line, and Jewish complaints about Roman rule began to grow, culminating finally in what is known as the Great Revolt or the First Roman-Jewish War. The list of grievances ticked off by the Jews usually included a host of religious issues, but as much as conflicts between the monotheistic Jews and polytheistic Romans antagonized both parties, at the heart of the Great Revolt was something far more basic, tax policy. Despite their persistent attempts to move away from the system, the Romans continued to rely on tax farming in Judea, and so dealt with the inherent problems that the system introduced. And just to recap, remember that a private collector would bid for the amount of tax Rome required, and then anything they brought in above that quota was the collector's profit. Local, upper, and middle-class urban Jews began to work these tax farming contracts, and in the eyes of the rural population and the lower-class laborers, began to shore the sheep a little too close to the skin in an attempt to maximize their profits. I bring this up only to note that with everything that happened at the outbreak of the revolt and beyond, I think it's fair to say that as much as the unrest was a Jewish revolt against foreign occupiers, it was also a civil war within the Jewish community itself, between those who were profiting from the existing political structure and those who were not. One of the other important things to note about why the revolt broke out in 66 and not some other year is that according to Josephus, the complete rebuild and expansion of the Temple of Jerusalem begun by Herod the Great was finally completed in 63 AD, which immediately left thousands of poor laborers and middle class artisans out of work. And basically, any time you have thousands of young men out of work concentrated in a city center, you are going to have problems. It took a couple of years scraping by while continuing to be gouged by the Roman collaborating tax farmers for these men to reach their boiling point, but when they did, boy did they ever boil over. They finally passed from 99 to 100 degrees Celsius in 66, when the Roman governor decided he was running low on funds, the imperial treasury having been systematically drained by Nero, and decided to simply confiscate all the money the high priest had accumulated in the great temple. When word got out that the high priests had allowed the Romans to have the money, which had been collected from the masses above and beyond the taxes they had already paid to Rome, well, that just about does it, don't you think? In August of 66 AD, an armed insurrection seized control of the Roman stronghold at Masada. The men who took Masada were members of a splinter group of the most radical sect of Judaism, the Zealots. These radicals, known as the Sicarii, which is Latin for daggers, were uncompromisingly militant and planned to settle for nothing less than the expulsion of the Romans from Judea. From their new base in Masada, this group of Sicarii headed north to Jerusalem, where they confronted the high priest who they believed to be a corrupt Roman collaborator. In the confrontation that followed, the high priest was killed, and in retaliation the leader of the Sicarii himself was assassinated. But this was only the beginning. As August gave way to September, the small Roman garrison in Jerusalem was besieged, forced to surrender, and then hanged by an angry mob. 
With the Roman military presence wiped out, Jerusalem became an increasingly dangerous place for Greco-Romans of all types. Not only were citizens of Rome targeted, but also any Greek-speaking foreigner who had made the unfortunate decision to settle in the city. And once the foreigners had all been purged, the mobs turned on Jews identified as collaborators with the Roman regime. When word came north that the garrison in Jerusalem had all been murdered, the legate of Syria took a legion south into Judea to restore order. But in November 66, the revolting Jews shocked the Romans by ambushing the invading legion at the pass at Beth Horon and not only wiping the Romans out, but also capturing their legionary eagle in the process. The victory would prove to be a mixed blessing for the zealots as it simultaneously convinced them that Rome could be beaten, while at the same time raising Roman ire to the point that they were done taking the insurrection lightly, which basically guaranteed that it was going to be crushed. Plans for a Roman response were escalated all the way to the imperial court, and in late 66, Nero appointed the general Vespasian to take command of the situation in the east and do what was necessary to reassert Rome's dominance in Judea. Titus Flavius Vespasianus was born in 17 AD in central Italy and entered public life for the first time in 36 when he was elected military tribune in Thrace at the age of 19. His father was of equestrian rank and his mother was the sister of a senator so Vespasian was fast-tracked up the cursus honorum and by 40 he had already served a quaestorship, an aedileship, and a praetorship. He married in 38 AD and had two sons, Titus, born in 41, and Domitian, born 10 years later in 51. The father and two sons would each eventually sit on the imperial throne, and collectively their so-called Flavian dynasty would rule Rome from 69 to 96 AD, providing the critical bridge between an empire ruled by members of the Julio-Claudian family and an empire ruled by whichever man was strong enough, smart enough, and savvy enough to hold on to power. When Claudius ascended to the throne, Vespasian was able to swing a friendly relationship with Narcissus into an appointment as a legate in Germania, and then a leading role in the invasion of Britain a few years later. Tasked with subduing the southern coast of the island after the initial invasion, Vespasian was so successful that he was awarded the right to wear triumphal regalia in public. The triumphal march itself was now reserved exclusively for the emperor. In 51 AD, he capped his public career off with a brief consulship. Though he was still young, Vespasian had achieved everything an ambitious man in Rome could have ever hoped for, so when his consulship was up, he retired from public life. But in 63, he was coaxed out of retirement by Nero and appointed governor of the province of Africa. Reports conflict about whether his administration was loved or hated by the locals, but at the very least it is agreed that Vespasian did not take the opportunity to extort a personal fortune for himself, as was usually the case with proconsular appointments, despite the constant regulatory reforms that were introduced every few years to discourage the practice. Vespasian instead focused on building a strong social network of clients and allies, and though we don't know if it was necessarily on his mind at the time, these allies will prove to be invaluable when he makes his move for the imperial throne just a few years later. When he was recalled from Africa, Vespasian joined Nero's imperial entourage as it toured Greece, and it was here that the thus far uniformly successful career of Vespasian hit a snag. Apparently, during one of Nero's numerous lyre performances, Vespasian had paid, quote, insufficient attention to the performance, read, he fell asleep, and immediately lost the emperor's favor, which made Vespasian a political non-entity. It speaks volumes then about the esteem that he was held in, that ultimately, when the crisis of Judea broke out and things started to go poorly for the Romans, that Nero turned back to the man he had so recently declared persona non grata. In other words, Vespasian's grave crime of dozing off could not outweigh the fact that he was simply the best man for the job. In April of 67, Vespasian arrived in Ptolemaeus, a Judean port on the Mediterranean coast, with two legions, and was shortly thereafter joined by a legion led by his eldest son Titus. Coupled with the force led by the Roman client King Agrippa II and other auxiliary forces, the army led by Vespasian soon numbered some 60,000. The Roman general set about systematically subduing the northern half of the province, accepting the surrender of towns that were so inclined and annihilating towns that refused. 
By early 68, he held the north and from his base in the port city of Caesarea began to sweep south along the coast. His task was made easier by the fact that the Jewish resistance was internally fractured. Not counting the leaders who wanted no part of the war with Rome to begin with, there were resistance leaders who counseled for opening talks with the Romans immediately, resistance leaders who counseled holding out but only to a certain point, and resistance leaders, among the zealots especially, who thought that any talk of surrender was proof that you were in league with the Romans and probably ought to just be killed. All these leaders wound up fleeing to Jerusalem throughout the year, where they all holed up together behind the reasonably sturdy walls of the city where they planned to make their stand. Vespasian and his son Titus prepared to lay siege to the city from three sides when an unexpected piece of news came that stopped Vespasian in his tracks. Couriers arrived from Rome with a note. Nero has committed suicide and Galba has been declared Caesar. Interesting. Wrapped up as he was in the far east of the empire, Vespasian could not have hoped to keep up with the daily politicking in the west, and when, in a matter of few months, Nero went from undisputed ruler of the greatest empire on earth to quivering child, Vespasian was shocked, but probably not surprised, if that makes sense. The great revolt in Judea will continue for another few years, but as the next important event in the struggle, the sack of Jerusalem, does not occur for another 18 whole months, I'm going to have to return to it after the yet-to-be-determined number of episodes I'll need to get through just the single year of 69 AD. So before we can keep going with the Great Revolt, we're going to have to backtrack a little and figure out what led to the shocking note that Nero had committed suicide. As I said, Nero's erratic behavior was getting really, really old. He was neglecting his official duties, spending all of his time at chariot races, and bankrupting the empire in the process. Not only that, he had initiated his own little reign of terror, and the senators and generals who made up the backbone of the imperial aristocracy all lived in fear of winding up on Nero's hit list. No less a figure than Corbulo, hero of the war in Armenia, had been ordered to commit suicide in 67 AD. It was only a matter of time, really, before Nero paid the price for his fear-inducing extravagances. In March of 68, a governor of one of the Gallic provinces, Gaius Julius Vindex, had finally had enough. Yet another set of orders had come down, ratcheting up the tax levies to help pay for Nero's total lack of fiscal responsibility. Vindex was a Roman all the way, but he couldn't help but feel for the local Gauls who were being taxed to the breaking point. He heard complaint after complaint from his subjects that things couldn't go on like this, and taking a look around, he believed them. The empire hadn't grown as large as it had, or as strong as it had, by breaking the backs of those that supported it. Vindex decided that Nero and the health of the empire were two ideas that were now mutually exclusive. But surprisingly, when Vindex declared in March that he was no longer taking orders from the emperor, he also declared that he himself was not looking to become the emperor. Instead, he announced that should Servius Sulpicius Galba, the wise and capable governor of Spain, rise to the occasion that Vindex would back him. But Galba was noncommittal, and Vindex was left hanging in Gaul by himself. Nero ordered the governor of Upper Germany, Lucius Virginius Rufus, to crush Vindex, and in short order, the stronger and more capable Virginius did just that, routing Vindex after a short and decisive battle. Vindex committed suicide to avoid capture, but his dream of dislodging Nero did not die with him. In the glow of victory, Virginius's troops did something unexpected. They declared their general Imperator, and swore to follow him if he decided to turn on Nero. But Virginius refused to betray the Emperor. In the end, despite having now allied himself with Nero, Virginius managed to escape the chaos of the year of the four emperors, and slip away unnoticed to live another thirty years in quiet anonymity. Good for him. Back in Rome, Nero watched all of this unfold with horror, and even though Galba had not joined in Vindex's revolt, it was clear that the old general was a rallying point for the emperor's enemies. So he declared Galba an enemy of the state and ordered him arrested. But this proved to be a fatal miscalculation. Galba had been wavering back and forth on whether or not to be the man so many seemed to want him to be. But when he got the notice that Nero had declared him an enemy of the state, well, that really helped make up his mind, didn't it? When the arrest warrant for Galba was announced, things quickly got out of hand for Nero, 
one of the Praetorian prefects, Gaius Nymphidius Sabinus, declared his intention to follow Galba as civil war broke out. With a large chunk of the guard following their leader, Nero suddenly realized that he was in a very tight spot. Afraid for his life, that happens when your bodyguards start hinting that they too would like to see you dead, Nero fled down the road to the port of Ostia, where he hoped to lead a fleet east and regroup. But the soldiers at the pier could tell which way the wind was blowing, and they refused to obey Nero's orders, taunting him with a line from the Aeneid, Is it so dreadful a thing to die? Really, really spooked now, Nero returned to Rome and tried to figure out how in the hell he was going to get out of this alive. He considered throwing himself at Galba's feet and begging for mercy. Then he considered throwing himself at the people's feet and begging them for mercy, but rejected both of those ideas as likely to lead to his swift execution. So he then considered fleeing east and asking the Parthian king for asylum, but realized that that too was a ridiculous idea that would never work. He tried to sleep on it in the palace, but woke up around midnight and realized that the guard had all deserted their posts. Scared out of his wits, he searched the rooms of his friends, but found them all empty as well. Nero had been deserted. Recognizing that there was no version of this story that ended well, Nero called out for a slave or a gladiator or anyone to kill him, but no one answered, prompting Nero to exclaim, Have I neither friend nor foe? No one answered him, but I can answer. Nero may have had no friends, but he was certainly not wanting for foes. Finally, Nero was able to connect with a freedman who agreed to hide the frightened emperor in a villa four miles outside of Rome. Accompanied by a few slaves, a disguised Nero slipped out of the palace and made his way through the gates of the city undetected. Upon his arrival at the villa, he ordered the slaves to begin digging a grave, and allegedly kept repeating over and over again, what an artist the world is losing. At some point, a courier arrived and delivered the news that Nero had been dreading. The Senate had met in an emergency session, declared him a public enemy, and announced that if found, Nero was to be beaten to death. He tried to kill himself to avoid capture, but kept losing his nerve. When the sound of approaching horses began to cut through the night, though, Nero was able to focus, and before the soldiers arrived to collect him, Nero stabbed himself in the throat. When the detachment arrived, they tried to stop the bleeding so Rome could extract the full measure of its vengeance, but Nero was too far gone. As they worked on the wound, he whispered, Too late. This is fidelity. Nero died on June 9th, 68 AD at the age of 30. He had ruled Rome for 14 years. The death of Nero marked the end of the Julio-Claudian dynasty and would usher in a brief period of chaotic uncertainty known as the Year of the Four Emperors, which we'll start to get into fully next week. The question on the tip of everyone's tongue was, now that there was no Julio-Claudians left, how would legitimacy be conferred upon future emperors? Augustus had been able to establish and maintain imperial authority initially through his own personal brand of ruthless charisma, and the fact that his reign just kept going and going and going, so that by the time he died, it seemed natural that his declared heir Tiberius ought to rule. From there, it had just been an unbroken line of inheritance all the way down to Nero. But now that that line of inheritance was broken, well, what did that mean? It was like Rome was waking up after being hypnotized. Suddenly, everyone was looking at everyone else, blinking, and wondering what to do now that the Julio-Claudian spell had been broken. Nero had died with no heir, and there was no mechanism to determine which of the dozens of highly ambitious men ought to rule, nor any way to tell whether or not the masses would accept someone from outside the house of Caesar as their master. Or how about this? Maybe the Julio-Claudian period will prove to be a historical aberration. Maybe Rome can return to its republican roots. There was no shortage of questions and no shortage of ambitious men who claimed to have the answer. Next week, We'll try to lay the foundation for the seminal year of 69 AD and give a deeper introduction to the men who will vie for the throne. But I can tell you this much already. The correct answer is Vespasian. Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 68, three emperors. <laughs>
the house of Caesar was no more. Though the name Caesar would live on as a symbol of power, authority, and legitimacy, the family itself was now officially defunct. From the moment Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC to the moment Nero committed suicide some 117 years later, Rome had been dominated by the Julio-Claudian dynasty. No one alive remembered a time before they rose to power, and now suddenly, without warning, they were gone. Does anyone around here have any idea what we're supposed to do now? The thing was, the initial transition from republic to autocratic empire had been midwifed by Julius Caesar and his adopted son Augustus, two men with personality so strong that they couldn't help but shape the whole governmental apparatus to match their own individual quirks, habits, strengths, and weaknesses. Their descendants had more or less failed to live up to the standards set by the two great patriarchs of the family, but they had also more or less continued the forms and practices of governance that had been handed down to them. One of the quirks of the initial principate was that the legitimacy and authority of the emperor lay not in codified rules or a spelled-out job description. Rather, it rested on an ad hoc collection of powers that had been accumulated by Augustus personally during the constitutional settlements of the 20s B.C., after his death, those powers had been passed along to his descendants for no other reason than that they were his descendants. It was an issue not of constitutional authority, but of family inheritance. So now that Nero was dead, and there were no more descendants of Augustus, would the collection of powers the family had accumulated remain bundled together and handed intact to some successor outside the family, or would they be broken up with different pieces being claimed by different men? And the biggest question of all, if that happened, who would put them back together again? Without a doubt, the most important power upon which the emperor's authority rested was his command over the legions. In the constitutional settlements, Augustus had made sure that he claimed as his own personal jurisdiction any province that contained a significant military presence. This meant that at the end of the day, however else you might feel about the emperor or his policies, you knew that you could never match the literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers he personally commanded. This had a tendency to keep everyone in line. Part and parcel of this authority was the fact that basically every general scattered across the empire was subordinate to the emperor. These various generals may have been rivals with one another, but they could each take comfort in the fact that that they all answered to the same man, and were thus, in a sense, all at least equal to each other. But when Nero died and this uppermost slot in the chain of command was lost, all of those same generals were now technically subordinate to no one. Well, maybe they were subordinate in some abstract way to the Senate and the people of Rome, but that was neither here nor there. The year of the four emperors, then, is best understood as a competition between the leading regional generals of the time to climb into that uppermost slot on the chain of command left vacant by Nero. Galba came from Spain, Vitellius came from the Rhineland, and Vespasian came from the east. While the Julio-Claudian emperors had commanded a force so large it was impossible to match, each of these men controlled forces that were large enough to prompt high ambition but not so large that they couldn't be met in the field by a force of equal size. And as much as regional politics played a role in why the various legions backed this or that general, the individual personalities of each of the four emperors, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian, played a significant role in how events played out. As I mentioned last week, the man who ascended to the throne upon the death of Nero was Servius Sulpicius Galba. Born in either 3 or 5 BC, he was an old stock patrician and the son of a prominent attorney who had served as consul during the reign of Augustus. An undistinguished man, the elder Galba, was best known for the fact that he was a hunchback, a birth defect endlessly mocked by the notoriously un-PC Romans. Augustus himself was even said to have poked fun at the hunchbacked lawyer. Galba's mother was the granddaughter of Quintus Catullus, a giant in the final days of the Republic, who had defeated the post-Sullen coup led by his consular colleague Lepidus, and then stood firmly opposed to Pompey, Crassus, and young Julius Caesar as they rose to prominence, and would have been one of the first triumvirate's key opponents had he not died just before its official formation. Galba was proud of his relation to Catullus, and used the great old senator's career as the model for his own life. 
His mother, however, died shortly after his birth, and young Galba was subsequently raised by his father's second wife, a beautiful and wealthy woman who would posthumously adopt Galba and leave him a fortune so long as he carried on her family name, which Galba did, though only officially. He had an older brother who made some attempt at a public career, but was plagued by scandal and poor judgment until he committed suicide during the reign of Tiberius after being passed over for a proconsular promotion one too many times. Galba himself rose quickly up the ranks, serving as praetor in 20 AD and then consul in 33. During Tiberius' reign, Galba caught the eye of the Augusta and was brought into her sphere of influence, but of course this put him at odds with the emperor who did not get along with his mother at all. When Livia died in 29, she left a generous bequeathal to Galba, but as executor of his mother's estate, Tiberius first cut the number down by a third and then simply refused to pay it out. When Tiberius died, though, one of the first things Caligula did to curry favor with the aristocracy was to restore all those inheritances that Tiberius had canceled or confiscated over the years. This sudden windfall had the attendant effect on Galba, and he remained loyal to Caligula even as the emperor's erratic behavior became unsustainable. He remained loyal to the Julio Claudians throughout his career and wound up serving administrative and military functions in Gaul, Germania, Africa, and finally, Hispania. He did, however, go into retirement during the early years of Nero's reign, though, as Agrippina continued to nurse a heavy grudge against him because Galba had once publicly refused her romantic advances. But after Nero killed his mother, Galba returned to public life, and in 61 AD he was posted to Hispania Terraconensis, the largest of the Spanish provinces. He would serve as governor there for the next seven years until he was declared emperor in 68, first by his own men and then by the Senate. Galba had a reputation for being a humorless throwback conservative in the mold of Cato the Elder. The Romans disliked extremes in either direction, so while the enormously wealthy Galba was always hailed for his restraint, he was also criticized for erring too far on the side of frugality. Throughout this period, though, he stands out as one of the few generals who did not actively bribe soldiers to join his cause, a practice he thought immoral and unnecessary. This refusal to bribe his men gets to the heart of another of Galba's most notable personality traits, his belief in strict and unquestioning discipline. He did not feel inclined to hand out bribes just because he was a miser, but also because an army should naturally obey its general. One should not have to convince soldiers to fall in line. One should simply order them to do so. And not only did Galba expect his men to follow his every command precisely, he also expected them to do no more than he had commanded either. Disobedience and personal initiative both were frowned upon in the legions of Galba, and as you can imagine, he both benefited from and was hurt by this approach. His reputation as a strict disciplinarian with an almost naive faith in the power of the chain of command is critical to the unfolding events of 69 AD. Following the aborted plot against his life in Germania, Caligula had brought in Galba to restore order to the legion stationed on the Rhine. Galba had apparently taken such a harsh tack with the men under his command that 20 years later, those same units would refuse to back the man that they had learned to hate, which led first to their attempt to make Virginius emperor, as I mentioned last week, and then later to their elevation of Vitellius. By the time the events that would define Galba's career unfolded, he was already an old man, about 70 years old, give or take. And as a result, his flagging energy led him to rely more and more on a core circle of advisors. Ironically, the man who believed so strongly that every subordinate was merely an extension of his own will was now widely rumored to be a wholly owned subsidiary of his three closest advisors, who became known as the three pedagogues because they taught Galba everything he needed to know. The most influential was Titus Vinius, a man of senatorial rank who was, according to Tacitus, quote, the most worthless of mankind. He was dogged by scandals of all sorts, with Plutarch reporting that he was imprisoned at one point by Caligula and was later accused of stealing a golden cup after attending a dinner hosted by Claudius. He wound up in charge of a legion in Spain, and somehow, though I don't really know how or why, he came to exert enormous influence on Galba, even though the two could not have been more different. Galba hated bribes. Vinius, it was said, would do anything for one. 
Along with Vinius, there was Cornelius Laco, who served as Galba's legal advisor. In contrast to Vinius, he was an honest, if lazy, man. When Galba ascended to the throne, he would appoint Laco as Praetorian Prefect, even though Laco had no military or administrative experience. Rounding out the trio was a freedman advisor named Icellus, who was in Rome when Nero committed suicide and was the one who brought the news to Galba. For making the trip from Rome to Spain in just seven days, Galba elevated Icellus to equestrian status. The former slave would then spend the rest of his short life accumulating the money his new rank required, like Vinius, by any means necessary. The three men were, of course, rivals for Galba's favor and attention, but they transcended their own bickering when it came to keeping others locked out of the inner circle. If you wanted to talk to Galba, you had to go through one of them. This was why the neighboring governor of Lusitania was forced to form a short-lived alliance with Vinius in an attempt to secure his own adoption by the childless Galba. Everyone knew that the old man would be dead soon, so as soon as Galba came to power, it was already time to start planning for the future. Marcus Salvius Otho, the young governor in question, was convinced that he could convince Galba to adopt him so that when the old man died, he, Otho, would become emperor. After all, an astrologer had told him that it would be so. Otho was born in 32 BC, making him by far the youngest of the four emperors. He was descended from Etruscan nobility, but his family had only reached senatorial status with his grandfather, who did so after the Augusta took a liking to him. As a result of this connection, Otho's father became close to Tiberius, and the family thrived under the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Otho himself was only five years older than Nero, and when the teenager became emperor in 54, Otho was right there by his side and quickly became one of Nero's most prominent drinking buddies. Together, they would spend their nights blowing through money, alcohol, and women, and Otho earned a reputation as a ringleader of the decadent proceedings. But in 58, the two had a falling out over Otho's wife, Papia Sabina. As I said last week, it is entirely possible that Papia only targeted Otho to get close to Nero, but it has also been suggested that Nero and Otho had arranged the match to put Papia on hold for Nero until the emperor could figure out how to rid himself of his wife, Claudia Octavia. If this latter version is true, then it seems that when it came time to hand Papia over, Otho had had a change of heart. However it happened, though, Papia went over to Nero, and Otho wasn't happy about it. To deal with this problem, Nero appointed Otho governor of Lusitania, which on the one hand was a fat promotion, as Otho had only served previously as a quaestor and didn't qualify for the post, but on the other hand, it was obviously meant to exile him from Rome. Despite everyone's expectations that this drunken gadabout would prove to be a disaster, Otho emerged as a competent administrator, and though he no doubt longed to get out of his backwater province, he seemed to have served his time conscientiously. But when his neighbor Galba declared his intention to take control of the empire, though, Otho seized on his chance not only to revenge himself upon Nero, but also to free himself from exile. He immediately sent word to Galba that the treasury of Lusitania was at the old man's disposal, an announcement Otho hoped would demonstrate some unique level of commitment to the cause, but apparently Galba received the news blandly, stating in essence, well, of course your treasury is at my disposal. I don't need you to tell me that. Undeterred, Otho also sent along some of his better slaves, who were worthy of service to a new emperor. But they were greeted with disdain by the frugal Galba, who disapproved of the extravagance that was beginning to affix itself to his entourage. But Otho convinced himself that he had really gotten on Galba's good side with all of these gestures, and set about trying to figure a way to convince Galba to adopt him, so that when Galba died, Otho could rise up in his place. He was especially convinced that this was his destiny, because during his time in Lusitania, he had grown enamored with an astrologer, who predicted soon after the news came of Nero's death, that Otho would become emperor soon. It was Otho himself, though, who made the leap to the belief that that meant Galba would be adopting him. In his excellent 69 AD, The Year of Four Emperors, which I'll be drawing on heavily for the next few episodes, Gwyn Morgan points out that if this was his plan, then Otho's power for self-deception was unparalleled. The taciturn and conservative Galba 
had not risen in revolt against Nero just to make sure one of Nero's drinking buddies wound up on the throne. But Otho was sure he was on the right track and arranged a deal to marry Vinius' daughter in exchange for Vinius' support on the issue of adoption. And in fact, Otho was so convinced that Galba was going to adopt him that when he learned Galba had chosen the more stable Lucius Calpurnius Piso instead, a blindsided Otho flew into such a rage that he assassinated Galba less than a week later. But we'll get into all that in a bit. So, so far, we have here two men, one at the end of his career, and convinced that it was not just his duty, but his right to assume the title of Caesar, and one who had barely started his career, but was crazy ambitious enough to believe that he was destined to don the purple. Having covered Vespasian, the man who would outlast them both last week, though I did botch his birth date, he was born in 980, not 17, and his son Titus was born in 39, not 41, thanks to alert listener Sarah for catching that, we are left then with just one more emperor to introduce, the third leg of the relay, which, as students of track and field will tell you, is always the slowest member of the team. And I don't just mean that figuratively, though I do mean it figuratively. I also mean that literally, Aulus Vitellius was probably one of the slowest men to ever ascend to the throne. Vitellius was born in 15 AD to a family either descended from ancient Latin nobility or descended from common stock nobodies, depending on whether you are talking to a supporter or an opponent of the man. His father was a prominent official who served with distinction under Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius. Such was the esteem in which the elder Vitellius was held that when he died, Claudius honored him with a state funeral. Not much is known about the early years of young Aulus, except for the rumor that when he was born, the horoscope taken on the occasion of his birth so horrified his parents that Vitellius' father wound up actually trying to hinder his son's career for his own sake and Rome's. The alleged horoscope stated that if Vitellius was ever put in charge of an army, that disaster would ensue. This prophecy hung over Vitellius' head, and as I said, his father used what influence he had to make sure that his son was always posted to non-military provinces. When Galba appointed him to command the legions of the Lower Rhine, it would prove to be the first military posting of his career. Did disaster ensue? Well, the legions under his command revolted against their emperor, won, then lost a civil war, and Vitellius himself was dead just a year after assuming the post, so yeah, I would call that disastrous for pretty much everyone involved. But up until that point, the affable and non-threatening Vitellius managed to thrive in a political environment where talent was viewed with suspicion, and he rose to the rank of consul during the reign of Claudius in 48 AD. More than a decade later, he was named proconsul to Africa by Nero in either 60 or 61. Throughout his career, Vitellius earned a reputation for good-natured laziness, unambitious but honest administration, but above all, a massive appetite for all the finer things in life. An unrepentant glutton, he banqueted frequently, usually stuffing four full meals into a day. His one major vice, beyond gambling, was that he would use the men at his disposal to go out into the wide world and bring home delicacies from across the empire. But though he was not cut from the same vigorous and athletic mold that perhaps his forebears were, Vitellius was always well liked by his subordinates wherever he went. The stories of his arrival on the Rhine after the ascension of Galba are peppered with accounts of his shaking hands with mule drivers, learning the names of slaves, and generally showing interest in all the various nobodies under his command. In short, Vitellius was a classic player's coach, the kind of man you love to play for, even if he wasn't strict enough to get the most out of your team. Discipline was lax, and parties were frequent. There could not have been a stronger contrast to the strict and humorless Galba than the flush-cheeked and jovial Vitellius, and the troops along the Rhine did not miss the distinction. On the one hand, there was the hated Galba, who had beaten them and worked them and driven them like pack animals. And on the other hand was beloved Vitellius, who joined in their dice games, let them off the hook if their uniforms were out of order, and shared his table with anyone who wanted to have some good food. So on January 1, 69 AD, when the legions across the empire were supposed to renew their oaths to serve the new emperor Galba, 
The legions on the Rhine refused. They were done with Galba. Vitellius was their man, and they declared him emperor by acclaim. The man most shocked to find Vitellius suddenly leading a full-blown revolt against Galba? Vitellius himself, of course. When I return from the break, we'll dive into the guts of the year of the four emperors. Galba will ascend to the throne, but as Tacitus says, everyone agreed that Galba would make an excellent emperor until he actually became emperor. His short and unpopular reign will be cut short when Otho assassinates him in January of 69. Otho will wind up committing suicide in April after suffering defeat in northern Italy at the hands of Vitellius's invading Rhine legions. Vitellius himself will only last until December. In over his head and ready to bow to the more formidable Vespasian, he will be unnecessarily murdered by Flavian partisans just before the arrival of the new year. Vespasian will then emerge into 70 AD as the founder of a new imperial dynasty. Next week, though, I'm going to pause our forward progress, and in honor of my own fast-approaching nuptials, we'll dedicate an episode to Roman wedding customs. And if there's not enough material to cover a whole episode, maybe I'll just ramble on a bit about Roman family life. Should be fun, so join me next week for A History of Rome Wedding. Hello, and welcome to The History of Rome, Episode 69, A History of Rome Wedding. So the history of Rome is getting married in a week and a half, and to celebrate, today we're going to set aside the steady march of history and do a short episode focused on Roman wedding customs. Remember also that after today, we'll be going off the air for four weeks while we here at the History of Rome do the thing where we get married and then do the thing where we move to Austin, Texas. When we come back, though, we'll do the Rock'em Sock'em drama of 69 AD and then move into the Flavian dynasty on our way to the Five Good Emperors the decline phase into the crisis of the 3rd century, and the surprising comeback led by Diocletian and confirmed by Constantine. Lots and lots still to come, so please stay tuned. Today, though, we've got weddings on the brain. Yesterday, we finalized the floral arrangements, picked up my suit from the tailor, scrambled for a workable solution to the wedding cake issue, and, gulp, went down to the giant brick building to pay for and sign an official wedding certificate that will formally make us husband and wife once it's signed by the state-sanctioned officiant who will perform the wedding ceremony. As it turns out, weddings are a confusing amalgam of emotion, tradition, and bureaucratic legalese. If that doesn't sound like the Romans, well, I don't know what does. It goes without saying that we have them to thank for a lot of what we all have to put up with when it's time to get married. As an institution, marriage dates back into prehistory and was codified as a legal relationship as early as Hammurabi's Code in the 1700s BC. There are competing theories about where the institution came from and why it persists, and I'm basically not going to touch any of that with a 10-foot pole, but I'm just going to say that by the time the Romans came onto the scene, marriage was a well-established rock upon which society was based. It was the manner by which property, wealth, rights, responsibilities, and alliances were transferred from one generation to another. Because all of this formed the bedrock of an enduring culture, as with most of the ancient world, marriage in Rome was not seen as the legal expression of love and commitment, but rather as the practical means to a practical end. The very idea of romantic love was so divorced from the concept of marriage, in fact, that those who stumbled into a union that actually involved romantic love, as with Pompey the Great and Julia, They found themselves the butts of jokes, rather than celebrated as models to be emulated. At all levels of society, Roman marriage was about cementing connections between families, securing and consolidating property, and creating clear legal lines of succession and inheritance. Love was left to poets and philosophers. Marriage was a serious business. There were different types of marriage in ancient Rome, but they broke down into two broad categories. Marriages where the bride was transferred as property from her father to her new husband, and those where she technically remained under the authority of her existing paterfamilias. The former category itself broke down into three types, one which was elaborate and formal, a second which was less formal but involved the ceremonial purchase of a bride by the groom, 
and one which was a sort of variation of today's common law marriage that only kicked in once a woman had been living with a single man for more than a year. The second category, where the wife was not formally subordinated to her new husband, was known as a free marriage, and in some cases, the woman became subordinate only to herself if their father died and had stipulated such freedom in the will. Roman women, or should I say Roman girls, were eligible for marriage at 12, and Roman men, or should I say Roman punk teenagers, were ready at 14. Most of the time, marriages were set up between boys and girls close in age, but often an older man marrying for the second or third time would choose a much younger wife. Though there was no real legal restrictions to this, or even very strict social taboos, men like Cicero still found themselves made fun of for the huge age discrepancies between themselves and their chosen wives. What really was taboo, though, was for a man to marry a woman older than him, and it was a striking exception that Octavian's first marriage was to the much older Scribonia. The matches would be arranged by the pater familiae, or fathers of the family, of the prospective bride and groom. Though the women of the families did not officially have any say in who would marry their sons and daughters, Roman matrons did exert considerable informal power over the process. Particularly in the case of brides, it was customary for the pater familias to consult with the mother of the bride when working up a list of potential candidates for her daughter to marry. The pater familias was not, of course, legally obligated to consult with the mother of the bride, but, you know, he did so at his own peril. In order for a marriage to be arranged and recognized, both the groom-to-be and bride-to-be were required to have something called connubium, or the right to marry. Basically, this meant answering the questions, are they old enough, are they Roman citizens, and are they presently married to someone else? The Romans had no truck with polygamy as it muddled up inheritance lines, and they did not, except under certain special circumstances, recognize marriage to foreigners. As you'll recall, this latter point formed the basis for Octavian's attacks on Mark Antony after Antony took up with the foreigner Cleopatra at the expense of his citizen wife Octavia. But beyond these technical requirements that answered the question, can I marry this man or can I marry this woman, there was the social requirements, should I marry this man or should I marry this woman. In the upper classes, this was especially important, but up and down the line, Roman mothers and fathers fretted over finding the right match for their children. That husband or that wife who would elevate their social status or bring in a particularly large dowry or gain them entrance into a prominent family. In the early days, you'll recall that there were all kinds of rules about who could marry who, with patricians and plebs not allowed to intermarry. When those restrictions were lifted, it became a really big deal for a plebeian family to hook one of their daughters up to a patrician man or to bring a patrician daughter into their house. On the other side, though, the patricians were never particularly excited to be sending one of their own off to join a plebeian family or to be bringing in some commoner into their distinguished line. But practical economics trumped aristocratic snobbery, as the cross-caste unions usually proved to be economic windfalls for many impoverished patrician families. After all the centuries of intermarriage, by the time of the late Republic and early Empire, the most important thing was not necessarily whether a candidate was patrician or pleb, but how distinguished their ancestral line was. For the upper classes, it was all about counting the offices held by your ancestors. If you were a young man from a distinguished family who could point to, say, four consulships and 16 praetorships held by your various ancestors, then you were looking pretty good. Bonus points were given or taken away depending on how recently such offices were held. So if the young bride's father had been a consul, then that would be a pretty sought-after young woman. But if her family was still clinging to the one consulship they had held in 436 B.C., well, people were just going to roll their eyes at that. Over the course of the Second Punic War, most of the upper-class men who could point to distinguished lineages were wiped out, and Rome saw the arrival of the Novus Homo, which led to the wholesale intermingling of lines. The young man who sought to be the first in his family to reach the consulship sought a bride who would connect him into a prominent, if depleted, aristocratic family. And that same aristocratic family was looking for men of merit, and more importantly, men of wealth, who would help maintain the family's place at the top of the food chain. <laughs> 
A perfect example of this is Gaius Marius, a young Publian man of talent and ambition, whose marriage into the ancient but floundering Julian line took his career and their political status to the next level. The lower classes worked in much the same way, but instead of playing in the VIP room, they played at the dollar tables, not that the competition was any less fierce. Everyone was trying to find the perfect match to raise the whole family up from where they had been previously, politically, economically, and socially. One of the overriding goals of a Roman man was to outdo the accomplishments of his ancestors, and marriage was another tool in his kit to help him accomplish this ever-present goal. Beyond the lineage stuff and the economic stuff, character actually played a pretty large role in the selection of brides and grooms. Roman society centered around public praise and public shame. So the serious young man who seemed to be a natural leader of men was more prized than the lazy man who seemed to be a natural drinker of drink. The former would create maximum praise, the latter maximum shame. For the women, it was all about being a dutiful, obedient, and loyal wife. Outspoken, uninhibited women were looked upon with suspicion, as again, the former would bring much praise, the latter much shame. As I think continues to be the case today, physical beauty was more highly sought after in women than in men. A pretty girl from a nobody family could catch the eye of some rich aristocrat and suddenly find herself elevating her family well above their rank as a result of a marriage proposal. For the man from nowhere, though, good looks were not his ticket to the top, but rather his promise. If he thought well and spoke well and carried himself well and possessed an ambition to succeed in public life, he might just find himself skipping ahead of men with better pedigrees, but worse habits. Once a marriage was arranged, it was time to announce the happy news. One way a new couple could signal their intention to marry was to simply appear in public holding hands. But often, a formal engagement party was thrown by the paterfamilias of the bride, with the groom to be seated as the guest of honor. At this party, the couple formally announced their consent to be wed, and the final details of the dowry, if there was one, were worked out between the two paterfamilias. As a visible symbol of the engagement, brides-to-be would often be given engagement rings, which they would wear, as they do today, on the ring finger of the left hand, believed to be linked directly with the heart. So I suppose I can't say that it was all business. Though a formal ceremony was not required to legalize a marriage, a wedding was as good a time as any to throw a party, so the happy occasion was often celebrated with a ceremony and reception held at the father of the bride's house. When picking out a day for the ceremony, the superstitious Romans studiously avoided the calends, nones, and ides of any given month, which, for example, would be the 1st, 5th, and 13th of September, and refused to marry in the unlucky months of February and May. June was considered to be the best month within which to marry, which may be the origin of the old a June bride expression. Once they successfully navigated the luck and unluck of the calendar, the families would set the date and send out invitations. For these types of aristocratic weddings, ten people were required to attend to fulfill the witness requirement. On the day of the wedding, the bride would ritually give away all her childhood toys and clothes and then be dressed by her mother in a single-piece, floor-length white gown with a ceremonial knotted belt believed to bring good luck that only her new husband could undo. Her hair would be parted by a ceremonial spear tip, be separated into six locks, and then topped by a floral veil. The groom, his family, and other guests would arrive in the father of the bride's home, and after the auspices were taken one more time to ensure that all was well metaphysically, the parents of the bride would hand her over to the groom. During the ceremony, the bride and groom would stand before a priest, holding hands, and they would exchange vows that usually included the line, Where you are Gaius, I am Gaia. Gaius being a name that held some particular luck for these types of occasions. After the vows were exchanged, the couple would offer a sacrifice to Jupiter in the form of either a pig or, as most of us are now used to, some type of cake. Following the signing of the paperwork and exchange of presents, the guests would sit down to a meal and prepare themselves for the upcoming wedding procession. The procession was the key to the whole shebang and served as the ritual transference of authority from the father of the bride to the husband. The bride would be guided out of her father's house by three boys 
and would lead the guests on a walk to her new husband's home. One of these boys would bear a torch that signified her father's authority over her, lit from the paterfamilias' hearth. As the procession wound through the streets, the train would grow larger and larger as the general public, often just for the fun of it, joined in the march. Along the way, onlookers would throw nuts, a symbol of fertility. At some point in all of this, the groom would split off from the party and hurry ahead to his house, where he would formally greet his new wife into their home. When she arrived at the threshold, some more rituals were performed, including the ceremonial snuffing out of the torch and tossing it to the assembled guests, and then the bride would carefully step through the door. The Romans were particularly superstitious about doorways, though, and just as often as not, the husband would pick up his new wife and carry her inside, so that she did not trip on her way in, which would have been a sign that the gods did not approve of the union. Once inside, the general public would go about their business, while the wedding guests would continue to feast and celebrate. When the time came, the couple would head off to a ceremoniously decorated wedding bed and consummate the marriage. Though not legally required, consummation on the night of the wedding was expected, and signaled that the two now held between them a contract of fidelity. The next morning, the bride would emerge from their room and begin her new life as a matron in her husband's family. Though affection and kinship kept her tied to her old family, legally, she was now the property of her husband. It goes without saying that the very, very soon-to-be-Mrs. History of Rome does not subscribe to this theory at all, even in jest. I'm serious. Make that joke around here sometime. So that's how the Romans got married. The modern Western world still holds to some of the traditions or variations thereof, and everything that I just described actually seems pretty similar to everything that I'm planning on doing in a few weeks. The engagement ring, the white dress, the veil, the offering of cake, the throwing of rice, the tossing of a bouquet. Like so much else in our culture, because that's how the Romans did it, is the answer to the question of why we do all of the crazy things that we do when it's time to get married. So that's it for now. I'll see you all again in four weeks from the new head office in Austin, Texas. I want to thank everyone for their well wishes on the wedding and the move. And to those of you who have donated money, I want to say that none of it would have been possible without you. I haven't touched a dime of the money that has come in, and it's been sitting in a honeymoon fund that has in the past few months been renamed the Moving Fund. To those of you who have thought about donating but maybe haven't gotten around to it, well, we're about to pick up and move across the country, and technically neither one of us has landed a job yet. So, yeah, now's the time. The History of Rome. Jupiter smiles on all of you.